Well, I think we've had a fantastic morning, and um, uh, you know we've been covering regulation and the digital transformations and AI. I think we're about to move, starting with this conversation, with a more sustained focus around security and foreign policy, uh, cybersecurity uh, issues. Uh, we have a lot of faculty here who are working on cyber conflict and financial stability and cyber risk. Um, and I'm really, uh, really uh, delighted uh, to have this chance to welcome David Sanger back to Columbia University. Uh, we have had the occasion uh, to have him uh, join us in Washington uh, and also occasionally uh, here. And uh, I know we have a hard stop at 2.15, so uh, we are um, be mindful of that. As you know, David has just come out with a fascinating, very compelling book uh, earlier in, in 2018, I mm -hmm. guess. Um, it just feels like yesterday we were talking about it, uh, which is doing incredibly well, called The Perfect Weapon, War, Sabotage, and Fear in the Cyber Age. Uh, if all worked as planned, it may even be downstairs available. It, I saw it when I came in, okay, so there, there we you are. Go. Out right. in its new paperback edition. Oh, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> And also joining us in this conversation, very happy John Patel is here. You heard him earlier. He has been with us this year as a senior research fellow. And I've been delighted to have John uh, as a partner in the organizing of this uh, with our, our working group for this digital forum. So I'm going to get started by um, asking a couple of questions to help us think about cyber conflict. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a lot of nuclear theorists, uh, you, you know, in, in security groups around, around the country sort of saying, well, you know, what's the analogy here with cyber? I mean, you, you, and your book deals with this question about how we, we found an uneasy modus operandi with the development of uh, you know, mutually assured destruction, a recognition that in the nuclear world, it would be so catastrophic that it had a real deterrent effect. But cyber is different, and that's what your book uh, really discusses. So we don't have norms, we don't have doctrine, you know, we don't have agreed upon frameworks uh, in the world. And I don't know if we even have a, a, any kind of shared understanding about the destructive power represented by, by cyber uh, conflict. So take us into this sure. complexity. Well, first, Mary, thank you. It's great to be back here. It's great to be with you, uh, back here with you. We, we go way back to uh, uh, lots of fun adventures uh, before and after I was living in Japan and back in DC. Uh, and great to be with, with you as well. Uh, it's good to have another journalist on the stage, you know, feel, feel somewhat protective. And it's great to be back at Columbia. Uh, my, my grandfather went here in the class of 1917, and I was forever the black sheep of the family by not going to Columbia, so I feel like you're restoring me here a little bit. <laughs> um, so to the question you've asked, so it's very tempting for a lot of people, particularly people in Congress, to look to um, the nuclear analogies because they grew up with them in the, in the Cold War. Yeah. And they figured, well, if we develop deterrence for nuclear, surely we can just move that over into the, the cyber realm. And of course, what we've discovered is that all the questions are the same as they are in the nuclear world, and all the answers are different. And that's true because the fundamentals of cyber as a weapon are different. First of all, it's dirt cheap. You don't need um, plutonium and uranium, which are hard to come by. You don't need, need the tens of millions or billions of dollars in infrastructure that the North Koreans, the Iranians, everybody else who's tried to get a nuclear weapon or succeeded uh, got. All you basically need is um, some laptops, some millennials, uh, some pizza. Uh, I, Heavily caffeinated drinks all help, right? And some stolen code from the NSA. Unfortunately, thanks to our friends at the NSA, there's a lot of that floating around. And if you've got that combination, you're pretty much in business, which is why at this point we only have, what, nine countries in the world that have nuclear weapons. And my, by my count, there are probably about 35 now that have a sophisticated 
enough ability to do a, a serious cyber attack, something better than just a denial of service uh, attack. So then comes the question, if that's the case, why is this so hard to deter? Well, one reason is it's very hard to tell often where a cyber attack is coming from. It's not that a cyber attack could simply be done uh, by a 400 pound guy sitting on his bed in New Jersey, as was suggested in a presidential debate, uh, but it is certainly, it takes time to go do uh, attribution, and sometimes it takes years. The United States just indicted about five or six months ago the chief North Korean guy who did the attack on Sony in 2014. Okay, so that gives you an idea of how complex it is to get these together. Mm -hmm. The bigger issue, though, is that even if you could figure out where it came from, the United States still lives in the belief that it's got a big lead. And as a result, it doesn't want to sign up to norms that give up a whole lot of options for the president. So if you and I were sitting down, or we made it a lunchtime project here to sit down and say, let's make a list of things that should be off limits if we signed up a sort of digital Geneva Convention, we'd come up with one pretty fast. Power grids, right? Because when you turn off the power, you're killing people in nursing homes and hospitals and the most vulnerable. Um, emergency communication systems. Election systems, how about that? Anybody interested in like saying election systems should be off, off limits? Financial data. Financial data, okay. Now change for a minute and pretend that you're presenting this in a situation room meeting with the CIA director and the Treasury Secretary and others. And what are they gonna say? The CIA director is gonna step in and say, well, I read in Sanger's book we had a program called Nitro Zeus to turn off all the power in Iran if we got into a conflict with Iran that was forestalled by the 2015 nuclear agreement, but maybe it's back on, who knows, right? Um, do we really wanna tell a future president you can't turn off the power in a country, you have to go and bomb them? Supposing turning off the power results in fewer casualties. Election systems, supposing we had a cheap and easy way to keep another Maduro from taking office in a place like Venezuela, by manipulating the election rather than going through what we've just gone through or what we're still going through. Do you want to tell the president he can't do that? Um, supposing uh, you come to the conclusion that shutting down the communications of all of the Chinese ability to talk to say their nuclear weapons operators or their troops would be better than some kind of conflict in the South China Sea. So it's not only that the rest of the world isn't ready for it, I don't think we're ready for it. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you one more question because, and then turn it over to John. You know, I've been trying to uh, <clears throat> come to a view, which I do not have, um, uh, as to what are the differences between the Obama administration and the Trump administration on cyber. On the one hand, it looks like, you know, they've removed a, a visible cyber person from uh, the White House. On the other hand, they seem to be developing a new doctrine, uh, a defense forward uh, doctrine, uh, empowering DHS in a different way. Um, and I'm just wondering how you would assess what is our sure. cyber policy today? Uh, well, there are a few veterans of the Obama administration cyber operations here. So if you see thrown tomatoes during the course of this, <laughs> you'll know I've got, how I've gotten this wrong. So I think the Obama administration put a lot of work and thought into defenses, into the kind of questions that we were just discussing today. I think the Sony hack made them think really hard about what's an act of war, what's an act of vandalism, what's an act of sabotage. People were debating that after, after the North Koreans took out Sony. The president had to sort of step in and say, I'm terribly sorry, but um, stopping an incredibly bad movie from coming out is not an act of war, you know? Uh, but they had a big argument about what it was that attacking a company, a company would be. Um, they had a lot of lawyers in the game, and that made them hesitant to do a number of offensive cyber operations. When they were going after the North Koreans, they didn't want to go in through China to 
to either attack North Korea's cyber infrastructure or shut them off because the lawyers were saying, rightly, you know, the Chinese are likely to get upset if you're inside their networks attacking another country. The issues come up with the Germans, where a lot of um, ISIS um, uh, operators were using uh, German uh, cloud services and so forth. So I think they were a little more cautious, and they wrote a cyber policy that enabled everybody who had a piece of the action, and some people who were just walking by, to come in and have a voice in the policy. So when President Trump went to go rewrite it, uh, I think the, he had a pretty experienced staff at first, they all got fired later, um, but their experienced staff said, let's find a way that will reduce the number of people who are in the middle of these conversations, which I have to tell you, even veterans of the Obama administration have told me they would have welcomed, right? Um, and then that devolve, devolves more power down to the head of the NSA and US Cyber Command. And in fact, the secret order that the president signed last August, we have not seen a declassified version of it, but the best we can learn about it is that that empowers Cyber Command to go deep into um, adversary networks with all kinds of implants to see what's going on. Because if you try to stop a cyber attack when it's coming to the United States, it's too late. You have a tenth of a second to hold your meeting. Uh, so uh, they have done that, and so far as we can tell, they have done one major operation under that, and that was the midterm election. You may have covered this a little bit during the earlier panel, where they went in and shut down the Internet Research Agency's um, servers for a couple of days. They um, did the same to the GRU. They sent text messages to hackers in Russia who they think were active in election stuff and said, we know where you live and we know where your cell phone is. And you'll get a visit from us if you're messing around. Now, we don't know how effective this was, in part because the administration classified its after action report, thus stepping on their own deterrence, right? Um, which is what usually happens in cyber, where people so wrap so much secrecy around it that they, that they uh, I think, to my, my own mind, is that um, they actually harm our deterrent effect uh, under the argument that you can't reveal your capabilities your, and so forth. I think that's a, a backwards and sort of old nuclear way of thinking about it for cyber purposes. Um, what worries me is that when they got rid of a Homeland Security advisor, Tom Bossert, who knew his way around this territory, and then when they got rid of the position of cybersecurity coordinator, which had been held by a man named Rob Joyce, known to some of you in the, in the room, who had been the head of the NSA's Tailored Access Operations Unit, the sort of special forces that does offensive cyber, you suddenly took away a lot of the expertise about how you design cyber defenses which, by the way, you want designed by people who break into foreign networks for a living, right? Because they're the same reason you want Willie Sutton doing your, your bank security, right? So um, I think we're in a pretty dangerous place in where the government is on the coordination of all of this. And if there ever was a giant cyber event and a 9-11 kind of commission that uh, came together, I think one of the first questions would be, why did you dismantle this structure? Mm -hmm. Thank you. This was not the question I was going to ask, but why did he dismantle the structure? I, I think John is pretty simple. I don't think it had anything to do with cyber. I think it's that those officials had sort of direct access to the president under the Obama administration. And I think John Bolton wasn't interested in other people in national security having direct access to the president. I don't know why that would be, but I... Yeah. <laughs> Something about all caps tweets. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. You, you, you referred to this uh, event. You and I discussed this briefly prior. Um, the, the sort of cyber Pearl Harbor. I mean, it's clear from both your coverage and your book that you believe that the public dialogue around these issues is 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 not where it should be, mm -hmm. and that our doctrine, such that it is, is more confusing to me than it is to you, Merritt. Um, is not where it should be. Is there an event that might occur that would change that dialogue where all of us wake up 
And if so, what does that event look like? Like, make it real for us. Sure. So if you all woke up in the dark and nothing was working, you know, your lights weren't going on and your internet wasn't connected, uh, and worse yet, you couldn't get on Netflix, um, <laughs> that could be like a, 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 a deci decisive event. Um, and you could draw all kinds of great cyber, Pearl Harbor kind of scenarios. And that phrase has been around for about 20 years, but you may remember that Leon Panetta made a big deal of it when he came here to New York and went out and gave a speech out on the aircraft carrier down uh, in the 40s. And he um, uh, basically argued that we needed more funding to avoid a great cyber Pearl Harbor. So I was having lunch with him a few months ago. Uh, it was out near the Panetta Institute where he's living a happy life in California. I said, Leon, you know, I argue in the book that a cyber Pearl Harbor is the least likely thing to happen. I'm not saying it won't happen. It could be on the way to a bigger war or conflict it could happen. But the way cyber is used by states is to avoid a military retaliation. And if you turn off all the lights by, from Boston to Washington, the chances that you're going to go get visited by um, a stealth bomber are probably pretty high if they figure this out. And he said, David, how long have you lived in Washington? Really? He said, I needed to come up with a phrase that was going to get the attention of members of Congress who have no idea about cyber, which he thought would be a number well over 400. Um, and, you know, to do that, if you're not going to educate them on cyber, you're going to have to make them analogize to something that they don't want to get blamed for. And that was where Cyber Pearl Harbor came up. When you think of the range, and one of the reasons I wrote The Perfect Weapon was to try to explain the range of cyber attacks, you've got surveillance something we know well, but which is fundamentally pretty boring. You've got, I mean, we, we opened mail, we tapped phone calls, not that big a difference to go into email, and you can find people who worked for the NSA 20 years ago involved in something called computer-to-computer -computer interception that was basically reading email. And that seemed cool 20 years ago. Today, if you told a rising software engineer, we're going to put you on a job of reading email, they'd probably leave and go take their job at Google, right? right. Uh, where they could read a lot more email. Uh, so, um, uh, then you've got data manipulation. And data manipulation, you can imagine all sorts of things. You raised one, changing financial records. You wouldn't have to retarget all of the Pentagon's weapons. You would just have to get in and change everybody's blood type in the Pentagon database. Imagine the kind of data, the kind of trouble you could cause with that. Um, data manipulation is essentially what the United States did in Olympic Games, what you guys know as Stuxnet. The code name was Olympic Games, which was getting into the centrifuge, the controllers for the centrifuges in Iran, and changing the input data so that they sped up and slowed down and spun out of control. And that takes you to a third layer of cyber attack which is using the computer controls that we have put on real world systems to make those real world systems go awry. You know, in the great tragedy of the Boeing case, we found that those planes were crashing because of a sensor misread between two different sensors that were feeding into an automatic flight controller. Now imagine that somebody breaks in and alters the data coming in from sensors. Right. right, And you'd spend months trying to figure out, was the sensor bad, or did somebody get inside it? Right. Right. Uh, and then the fourth area, which you spent some time discussing today already, is just influence operations, which fundamentally isn't about cyber. It's fundamentally about taking propaganda and putting it online and speeding it up. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 following up to that, um, you know, there's probably a few people in this room who believe that what Russia did in 2016 did in fact influence the election mm -hmm. um, and therefore believe that that was a cyber attack that was an act of war. I mean, I, people can take that logical progression and say that was a concentrated attack by a foreign body that changed the course of our history in ways that you know, did significant uh, damage to our country. Does, uh, does cyber change the definition of, of, of an act of war? 
Well, it certainly could. Let me give you an analogy that doesn't use the election system and then come back to the election system. So we talked about the Sony attack before. And in that attack, it got a lot of publicity because they let emails out before the Russians figured out how you break into systems and let emails out. And it's from that that we discovered the important national security news that Angelina Jolie is difficult to work with on the set. Um, <laughs> but the more important uh, thing that, we, that you had to remember from the Sony attack was that in two and a half minutes, they brought down 70% of Sony's computing systems. They worked at it for three months before they did the attack, but when the attack actually happened, the hard drives got wiped. So now ask yourself the question, supposing they didn't have the advantage of cyber to go do that, how would the North Koreans have done that? Well, they would have landed at Long Beach and gotten an Uber up to the studio and gotten on the studio tour with all the little kids and snuck away and stuck dynamite under the computer center and run like hell. And you would have seen the computer center blow sky high and there would have been great images on CNN, right, of smoke rising over the Hollywood sign. I would argue that if that was the case, any American president would probably have to make something blow up in Pyongyang. But because they didn't have the smoke and didn't see it, they didn't categorize it as an act of war. It wasn't immediately clear who had done it. And by the time they figured out who had done it, reacting that quickly would have, reacting that slowly, I guess I should say, would have, would have seemed strange. So these analogies are really hard to put together. Now get to yours. So in the election system, we've got a couple of things we don't know. We believe it affected the election outcome, but none of us can prove it did. You'd have to crawl inside the minds of the 77,000 people in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and so forth that voted other ways, right? Um, we were wildly underprepared, so underprepared that the Homeland, Department of Homeland Security's listings of critical infrastructure included the power grid and the communications grid and the Washington Monument and the Jefferson Memorial, but not the election system, the underpinning of our democracy. Right. What were they thinking, right? And the answer was that they weren't really thinking about where their most critical data was stored and what could happen to it. Just as OPM wasn't thinking that they were holding on to the most critical information about people who get security clearances. So do I blame the Russians? Yeah, it was a really nasty thing to go do. What I really blame is us for not thinking broadly enough. And the question I keep asking inside the New York Times and outside is why would we ever think the Russians would come back and play the same playbook in 2020? When they come back, it's gonna be with something different or it's gonna be the Chinese and the Iranians or some other set of players. So let me ask you, I mean, one, one, I'd like to reference a recent incident and see what you think about it as a way of saying what should we be doing as a result that goes beyond hardening our systems. I mean, I think there was a recent incident with Hamas and Israel that you could probably explain better than I, uh, but where there was some cyber hacking that seemed to have resulted in a kinetic response by Israel. Um, so it was a military response uh, to a cyber incident. And I'm just wondering, what do you think the U.S. should be doing? I mean, it, it's uh, differently. I, I think you have some suggestions in your book that the U.S. should be more aggressive. Yeah. Um, well, certainly, I argue in the book that people have to feel that they're paying a price if they're going to do a cyber attack, right? And North Korea didn't feel they were paying a price. They got a few sanctions on them that I doubt they felt with all the other sanctions that they had. The Russians didn't pay a price for going into the White House, the State Department, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, unclassified systems, and some classified systems, and the Pentagon, um, and weren't even called out by name by the Obama administration before they went into the Democratic National Committee. So if you're Putin, you're sitting here thinking, well, they're not gonna defend the White House email system, who's gonna care about the DNC, right? One of the, one of the things that has been consistent in American cyber policy across administrations is if there's a cyber attack, the response is not necessarily in the cyber realm, right? And that makes sense. 
Because if you're attacking the North Koreans, I guarantee you they have fewer IP addresses than you have in any block of Columbia University, right? So the idea that you're going to go take down their structure is a little bit silly. Or as somebody said, it was quoted in, in The Perfect Weapon, um, you can't exactly turn out the lights in a country that hasn't turned them on. Um, so I can understand why the Israelis were tempted to do what they did. There is a really interesting question, which uh, Jay here and others I'm sure will be mulling, and I've been mulling for a while here, which is, did the Israelis cross some kind of Rubicon here when they responded to a cyber attack from Hamas by blowing up the building they think it came in? And I can't find another case. That's how you weigh a reason. Yeah, I can't find another case right now where that was the response. And I think what the Israelis were trying to do was shake up their adversary some, who was thinking, well, if we do a cyber attack, they're not going to come back to us with a bomb. Whereas if we blow up something by a checkpoint, they're certainly going to come back with a bomb. Mm -hmm. And so on the one hand, you can see why they would want to go do that. On the other hand, it tells you that that wall is breaking down. And all of a sudden, if people begin responding to a lot of cyber attacks with military attacks, you're in a world of escalation you may not be able to predict. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> probably more than any country, even Russia, in the conversation so far here, China has been uh, brought up. Uh, its potential dominance of AI, its perfection of a surveillance society, um, uh, you know, the, the size and government support for its companies, the amount of data it has. Uh, it's been in the news a lot and in the industry that I've covered for, for many decades in the technology industry as, you know, winning in 5G. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 new, the new sort of, you know, uh, broadband infrastructure and one of the companies that has been at, at the forefront of that is, is, is Huawei. Um, what do you make of this geopolitical standoff around uh, a telecom switch? So I think one of the things that people failed to see about 5G a few years ago was that this wasn't just like the move from 3G to 4G and all yeah. that. It wasn't just something that was going to make your cell phone faster, although it does that. But instead, it's a rewiring of a good deal of the internet because the core of 5G is that it is designed to take on that huge number of Internet of Things devices that suddenly have come into our lives and into the lives of manufacturers and all that. And if you think about it, 10 years ago, when you were down at you know, 2G levels and so forth in your cell phone, <laughs> You probably had two things connected to the internet in your house, a laptop and maybe a desktop. And now you've got your Alexa and your smart TV and your surveillance cameras and your alarm system and your smart refrigerator that's Wi-Fi connected. I never quite figured out what I need one of those for. I guess if it told me to eat less, that would be useful. Um, uh, and these are growing at such a rate that as the end of last year, we thought we had about 14 billion Internet of Things devices in the world. And we think that by the end of next year, it'll be about 20 billion. And what that tells you is that the actual 5G um, network uh, is now getting to the point where it's largely software with a switch underneath, and that it will become um, updated. It will be updated as often as your iPhone is updated, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the result is you can't really go into that software and understand whether the Chinese or anybody else have built in a back door with each update. I mean, when you get the update on your on your Apple, do you stop and say, you know, before I turn on the phone, I want to do a code analysis of what Apple just put into this? Of course not. You just trust them that they're doing it right. So now what's happening as um, 5G um, spreads out uh, around the world? 
What's happening is countries are having to declare that they're on one side of this or another. Mm -hmm. And you've seen Mike Pompeo go out a little bit in a blunderbuss way and basically say, if um, you sign on to the Huawei system, we're never sharing intelligence with you again. Which one day is gonna lead one of those countries to say, you may notice the intelligence sharing is a two-way street. And you know, we just told you about that ISIS cell that was forming. So I'm not quite sure we're gonna quite get to where we wanna be doing it this way. Um, but I would say that in a year or two, 5G could well end up being the new Berlin Wall where you're either staying, living on the authoritarian side of this, which is an internet built by the Chinese and the Russians and used to control a population, or you're on the Western free side of this, which is an internet that we hope looks kind of like what we have now, but more powerful. And there will be countries trying to live on both sides of the wall. And just as there were in the Cold War. And the big question is going to be, how do we manage that? Do we freeze out everybody on the authoritarian side? Or do we learn how to live in a dirty network? A mm -hmm. network that essentially you're not going to be able to secure all elements of it. And a network in which some NATO countries are relying on some Chinese equipment that could shut down in a conflict. Well, I know you have to leave. I'm uh, maybe more conscious of it than you, in which case we'll, we'll just keep going because yeah. we're having <laughs> such a good time here. But let me ask you one last reaction to that. I, I was talking to a very senior um, telecommunications um, executive on this question earlier in the week, and he said, you know, the Americans think or acting like uh, compliance with their, you know, uh, approach means just changing the wheels on the car, but it actually means changing the whole car. And so if we, if we take Huawei out of the system, it will take 5G back three or four years uh, for us, some are saying. Is that right? Is that how you think about this? I don't think, I don't know anybody who believes that. Um, there are competitors to, to Huawei, Nokia, uh, uh, Ericsson, Samsung, all make some similar switches. Um, people have had a hard time explaining to the president why American companies are not doing that. American companies are pretty well pulled out. And I wouldn't be surprised if we get to a position where there's a crash program to get the US back into that. And I'm not sure that would be a bad thing. Um, the 5G stuff is rolling out now. Yeah. And uh, you're gonna have it in major American cities within a year. Now you may not have the phone with the chipset that enables you to take the great advantage of it. Uh, you've, if you've got an AT&T phone, you've already seen that little 5GE evolution show up. That, because modern iPhones, the most recent generations, have a chipset in it that you can ramp up some. This is gonna roll out over a number of years, but um, the train has left the station. Mm -hmm. And we have to recognize that we could bar Huawei and they could still have 40 to 60% of the world market. Right. In which case, we're gonna have to communicate with countries that are using Huawei switches because it turns out we do business with countries that use Huawei switches, including China. And Germany, and, and the United Kingdom. Right, and that, Germany and the United Kingdom, that's gonna be the really fascinating fight, because they're, they're the core of NATO. And you know, there was a big fascinating fight in Seoul a few years ago, when Huawei won a bid to go put in a not pre-5G, put in a new cell phone network just for the city of Seoul. And suddenly US command in South Korea was saying, wait a minute, we use this network for day-to-day, -day, not wartime, but sort of day-to-day -day communications. We not, we'd rather this didn't go over a Chinese network. And that turned out to be the first of skirmishes that we're now seeing take place around the world. Mm -hmm. This has been a fantastic conversation. I wish we had more time, but I understand he is en route to a holiday and has to catch an actual uh, an, an actual an actual car. But car, I thank you so again for having me. It's been here. great to have thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, David. Fantastic. Thank you so much, John. Thank you.